Okay, and you'll post that for everyone? Yeah, I'm gonna send it to Mira. Okay. Does anyone else want to record just as a backup, just in case there's a problem? Okay, hopefully it will all go well. Um, oh, Emily, you have your hand up, you're gonna record? Okay. Okay. So something is up with my laptop, so um, I texted Rachel and she'll do it for me today. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so you got my email about the practice test that you need to take to get make sure you have your lockdown browser set up for the exam. Um, the sooner you do that, the better. Um, there's no, uh, there are points on there, but it's not worth any points. It was just part of me figuring out how to set it up. So don't pay attention to how many points you get on it or how much it's worth. Um, I probably won't even go in there and grade it. Um, the short answer parts, because it really wasn't for that. It was really just for you guys to practice on there and get the lockdown browser. And I'm going to look at it to see what it's like to grade those, but I'm probably not going to go in and grade because I have like, 200 of them. So um, it was really mainly just for practice. Um, and if you have, but if you have a question about one of the questions on there, you can always email me that. Okay. Um, so hopefully you guys have been keeping up on your study guide. Today is our last lecture before your test. Um, Wednesday will be review and your test is on Monday. Okay. Do you guys have any questions for me so far? Okay, I'll take that as enough. Um, okay, so I will spend a little bit of time reviewing um, what we've done already on chapter seven, and then we'll make sure we're finishing chapter seven. Um, what was the last thing we did? We did the alveola and capillary diffusion. Okay, capillary, last time we stopped at pulmonary diffusion. All right, thank you. Drawing the respiratory membrane, explaining pressure gradients for oxygen. Okay. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Evelyn. Okay. So let's go back. Um, Rodolfo, can you please tell me the four different components of respiration? <clears throat> pulmonary ventilation, pulmonary diffusion, transportation, and capillary diffusion. Good. And of those, which is internal respiration? Uh, capillary diffusion. Good. Um, RP, what is pulmonary ventilation? Pulmonary ventilation is when air moves in and out of the lungs and it's part of the um, external respiration. Okay, good. What are the two parts of it? Of external respiration. Of um, pulmonary ventilation. Oh, um, inspiration and expiration. Good. Tatiana, can you please explain how inspiration works? Yeah, so inspiration is air into the lungs and it's an active process. Um, it's due to the contraction of the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. So when you inspire, the volume of the lungs expands and the pressure decreases and it causes a pressure gradient. Good, so where is the pressure higher? Where? Yeah. Oh, it's, um, is it higher in the, in the lungs or? Well, okay, so we have a okay. pressure gradient. Right. Um, which means there's a difference in pressure. There's high pressure in one area and low pressure in the other. And okay. the air is going to move from high pressure to low pressure. Okay, so. If we are contracting the diaphragm and expanding the lungs, that's an increase in volume and a decrease in pressure. Right. Right. So if we have a decrease in pressure inside the lungs, then we're going to have low pressure inside the lungs as compared to high pressure in the outside air. So the air is going to move from high to low, so it's going to move into the lungs. Okay. Okay. So make sure you understand it as a, as a concept and a process. So you're saying all the right words, but you didn't have the 
the connection. You don't need to understand what, what exactly was happening. So, okay. um, Christian, what is the name of the law involved in inspiration and expiration that we talked about? Uh, the law is that the, um, for, for expiration, you said? Inspiration and expiration. Um, all three laws down, but I actually don't have that correlation. Oh, is it uh, Dalton's law, right? No? Mm -hmm. No. Is that what's the law involved in inspiration and expiration? Is it the Boyle law? Mm -hmm. What's Boyle's law say? Um, it's the inverse relationship between the pressure and the um, what is it and the volume. So okay. if pressure is low, then the volume is high, and vice versa. Good. So as the lungs uh, expand and compress, that's a change in volume. Okay, so as the volume goes up, the as the lungs expand, the volume goes up. Inverse relationship between pressure and volume. So if the volume goes up, pressure goes down. That's going to create a pressure gradient. Low pressure in the lungs, high pressure outside, so the air will move in. Okay, when we relax our diaphragm, we compress the lungs. That's a decrease in volume, which causes an increase in pressure based on Boyle's law. So now we've got high pressure inside the lungs as compared to the pressure on the outside. So the air will move down that pressure gradient, it will move out. Okay, so the gases will always move down a pressure gradient from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure trying to equalize. Okay, if pressure is equal in two areas, nothing will move. If pressure is higher in one area and lower in the other, the air will move in order to equalize it. Okay, imagine if you're driving down Reseda Boulevard and you're coming up to a red light and in one lane there are three cars already stopped and in the other lane there's no one there. Which lane are you gonna to go to? <laughs> You're gonna to go to the empty one, right? Because we also try to equalize ourselves and balance everything out. So you're not gonna go where it's crowded. You're gonna go where it's less crowded. So the gas is always gonna to try to equalize the, the pressure, okay? Um, and then we talked about the lung volumes and we drew the graph. Um, you guys okay with that? Do you have questions on it? Do you want me to review it? Can we review it? Sure. The long graph? Sure. Let me... My big thing is, like, would you ask us to label it, or are you looking for conceptual questions? Well, if it was, if we were taking the test in class, I would be having you draw and label it. But it doesn't look like you're going to be able to do a drawing. So I would be more likely asking you questions using the terminology or giving you a drawing and having you label it. Okay, so we did um, normal breath, normal breath, maximal breath, normal breath, normal breath. Oops. I'm going to do this really fast and messily because I don't want to spend that much time on it. Okay. Um, Rachel, what is this one called? That one's called tidal volume. It's a normal inspiration. Good. Uh, Shannon, what would this one be called? Is that um, oh my god. I don't know why it's doing that. Oh my god. Is that um my computer? I'm so sorry. That's okay. So to me, it's kind of logical if we have um, this one is our normal breath, but we have air that we could inspire beyond our normal breath we call that our, our reserve. So to me, it's kind of logical. This is the inspiratory reserve volume. So it's the, it's the volume of air we could inspire beyond our normal breath, the inspiratory reserve. And then if we put all those together, put those two together, um, Luis, what would that one be? Um, 
if you put both together, it would be the vital capacity? No, the vital capacity is going to be the maximum breath. This one would just be if you're if you're breathing normally, and then after your normal exhale, you take a deep breath. Um, Gwen, what would this one be? That one is the inspiratory reserve. This one is inspiratory reserve. <laughs> this one. Oh, that one is the inspiratory capacity. Inspiratory capacity. So what the air you could inspire beyond your normal inspiration is your inspiratory reserve. Mm. What if you include the tidal volume in normal breath plus your reserve, that's the inspiratory capacity. Okay, your maximal breath, maximal inspiration, maximal expiration is your vital capacity. That's the maximum amount of air you can move through your lungs in one breath. Um, Gavork, what would this one be? Sorry, uh, expiratory reserve volume. Good, expiratory reserve volume. The amount of air you could expire beyond your normal expiration. Um, Uh, Evelyn, what would this one be? Um, that would be residual volume, which would be the amount of air left in the lungs after max expiration. Good. So this is the air that's kind of stuck in the lungs that we can't get out. Residual volume. And then if we combine those two, Justin, what would that be? Um, that would be your functional residual volume. Functional residual capacity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then if we look at the vital capacity and include residual volume, um, Lauren, what would that one be? That'll be total lung capacity. Total lung capacity. Good. Okay, do you guys have any questions on any of those? Um, yeah, Professor Flick. So um, some of them, there's four, tidal, inspiratory, reserve, expiratory, and residual. They're defined with a definition. And then the other ones are just identified with a formula. Is that correct? Yeah, that's fine. There are some, there are some that only have a formula. Okay, cool. Like inspiratory capacity, tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume. Okay, thank you. And functional residual capacity. Okay, I'm going to clear this. And then... Um, Vanessa, can you please tell me the four parts of the respiratory membrane? Um, is it the alveolar wall, uh, the basement membrane, um, the alveolar membrane? I'm not sure about the last one. Yeah, so there's... Um, so if this is the alveola over here, it's this part of the lungs, right? So the alveola has its wall and its membrane. And then if this is the capillary over here, the capillary has its wall and its membrane. Okay, and the membranes are both called basement membranes. So we have the alveolar wall, the alveolar basement membrane, the capillary wall and the capillary basement membrane. Okay, the, the wall is on the inside. So this would be alveolar wall. And then the membrane is on the outside. So this one would be the alveolar basement. So we'll go ahead and label these capillary wall. Oops. Okay. 
Okay, so all of those things together make up the respiratory membrane, which is what the gases have to diffuse across. Okay, so we talked about, did we do um, Dalton's law? The partial pressures? We didn't do that yet. No. We didn't? No. no. Okay. So we said we have sorry. High levels of oxygen in the lungs because we're bringing in oxygen. We have low levels of oxygen in the capillary because this is deoxygenated blood that came from the muscles. So we have this pressure gradient. So the gas is gonna move from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. We, did we talk about that? Yes. Okay. And then in the capillaries, we have high levels of CO2 because it came from the exercising muscle. But in the lungs, we have low levels of CO2. <laughs> this is hard to talk. Low levels of CO2 because the air we breathe does not have a lot of carbon dioxide in it. So the carbon dioxide will diffuse down the pressure gradient into the lung so we can expire it. Okay, so this is where we stopped, yes? Yeah. Okay. So um, the air that we breathe is a combination of nitrogen oxygen and carbon dioxide. It's actually mostly nitrogen. So each of those gases exerts a pressure, okay, to the total air pressure. So nitrogen is exerting some pressure and oxygen is exerting some pressure. Nitrogen is exerting more pressure because there's more, more nitrogen than oxygen in the air we're breathing. So the more of a gas there is, the more it contributes to the total air pressure. Okay, so each gas is contributing to the total air pressure. So the pressure that each gas exerts and contributes, we call partial pressure. Okay, so we have pressure coming from the nitrogen, that's its partial pressure. We have pressure coming from the oxygen, that's its partial pressure, which is the partial pressure of nitrogen is higher than the partial pressure of oxygen because there's more nitrogen in the air than there is oxygen. And then the carbon dioxide has its own partial pressure that it contributes to the total air pressure. Okay, so this is Dalton's law. It says that total air pressure is equal to the sum of the partial Total air pressure is equal to the sum of the partial pressures. So the partial pressure is the gas, is the pressure exerted by an individual gas in contribution to the total pressure. If a gas has a high partial pressure, it just means there's a lot of that gas present. Okay, so the partial pressure reflects the relative amount of gas. So the higher the partial pressure, the more of the gas that's present. So the way we're gonna use that is now when I say there's a lot of oxygen present, what I will actually say is, instead of saying there's a high level of oxygen, I will say there's a high PO2. That means there's a high partial pressure of oxygen, which means there's a lot of oxygen present. Okay, and over here, I would say there's a low, PO2 in the capillaries. So the gas is gonna move from an area of high partial pressure to area of low partial pressure. So all I'm doing is adding that piece of terminology of partial pressure and, and showing you how I'll write it. So for CO2, I would say there's a low PCO2 in the lungs and a high PCO2 
in the capillaries. So that gas is gonna move from high to low partial pressure. Okay, you guys okay with that terminology? High PO2 means there's a lot of oxygen. A low PO2 means there's a little bit of oxygen. Do you want us to refer um, to like, do you want us to say PO2 like partial oxygen and partial carbon? Like instead of just regularly how you spell it? Um, well, not necessarily, but you need to understand what I mean when I say it. Okay. And actually we will be using that terminology in something in the, um, when we get to the, um, the next section of the transportation, we're gonna be using PO2. So yeah, you'll, you'll be using that. You'll need to use that term. Okay, then I have Henry's Law. Henry's Law says that gas dissolves in liquid in proportion to the partial gas dissolves in liquid in proportion to the partial pressure. Um, where do we have gas dissolving in liquid here? Is it the blood? We have oxygen dissolving into the blood. That's a gas dissolving into liquid. So gas dissolves in liquid in proportion to the partial pressure. In proportion means it moves together. So if one is high, the other will be high. So if we have a lot of gas, we'll have a lot of gas dissolving in liquid. We have a little bit of the gas, a little, little bit of gas dissolving in liquid. Okay, so in proportion to the partial pressure just means the amount. So um, that just all that means is if we have a lot of oxygen in our lungs, we will have a lot of oxygen dissolving into the blood. It just means we're not, there's not a lot lost in translation. It's not that only 20% of the oxygen is going to move across. Okay, if we have a lot of oxygen present, a lot of it will move over. Okay, don't overthink that. And then I have one more law for you. And this one's my favorite. Six law. I'm gonna write it out for you first and then we will talk about what it means. Six law says the rate of diffusion is Proportional to the surface area and the partial pressure path gradient. Fick's law says the rate of diffusion is proportional to the surface area and the partial pressure gas gradient. I'll give you a second to write that down. The rate of diffusion is proportional to the surface area and the partial pressure gas gradient. So let's take a look at what that means. The rate of diffusion. Rate means speed. Diffusion is referring to the movement of the gas across the respiratory membrane. Okay, so how fast the gas moves across the membrane is proportional to it means it moves together. So one goes up, the other goes up. Surface area. Okay, so the surface area here is referring to the respiratory membrane. So if this is the muscle, and oh, sorry, we're not talking about muscle. We're talking about alveolar. So that's not the muscle. That is. My dog will stop working in a second. This is the alveola. This is the capillary. Okay, so where the alveola and the capillary meet, right here, is where the respiratory membrane is. That's where the gas exchange is happening. Okay, so if we have capillary here and capillary here, 
and capillary here, we have more surface area dedicated to respiratory membrane. All of this is respiratory membrane. So the more respiratory membrane we have, the more surface area we have dedicated to respiratory membrane, the faster the gas will diffuse. Okay, the rate of diffusion is proportional to the surface area. Surface area is referring to respiratory membrane. So the more surface area we have dedicated to respiratory membrane, the faster the gas will diffuse. Okay, then the rate of diffusion is also proportional to the partial pressure gas gradient. The gas gradient is the difference in the partial pressure gas gradient is the difference in partial pressures. Okay, so the larger the difference in partial pressures, the faster the gas will diffuse. So go back and look at the partial, we have high partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs and low partial pressure of oxygen in the capillary. The bigger the difference is between the amount of oxygen in those two areas, the faster the gas will move. Okay, so for example, if we're resting, the muscles are not consuming a lot of oxygen when we're resting, okay? Just because the oxygen is in the blood being brought to the muscle doesn't mean the muscle is going to extract it and consume it, okay? So you know, the muscle is only going to consume the amount of oxygen it needs. So if you're resting, the muscle doesn't need a lot of oxygen. So that oxygen is going to stay in the blood as it circulates through the body. So when it comes back into the lungs, there could still be a lot of oxygen in that blood if you're, if you're not exercising. So there won't be a lot, uh, there won't be a large gradient here. So if, for example, we had um, 20 milliliters of oxygen here, and we had um, 15 milliliters of oxygen here, that's not that big of a gradient, so the gas would move slowly. Okay, but if you're exercising, you're extracting a lot of the oxygen out of the blood, then the blood that's going back into the lungs is deoxygenated. So here, I change it to five milliliters in the capillary, 20, 20 milliliters in the alveola. This is a bigger gradient, okay? It's a bigger difference. So the more, the bigger the difference here, the faster the gas will diffuse, okay? So you can imagine if um, Pam has a big plate of hot dogs in front of her and I try to hand her a hot dog, she doesn't need it. She doesn't want it, she's not gonna take it because she already has a lot. But if she doesn't have any and I try to hand her one, she might take it, right? So the more oxygen you need, the more it'll take, the faster it'll go, okay? So Fick's Law says the rate of diffusion is proportional to the surface area and the partial pressure gas gradient. So how fast the gas diffuses across the membrane depends on how much surface area you have dedicated to respiratory membrane and how big the pressure gradient is, how big the difference in partial pressure is, okay? Questions on fixed law? Or anything involving capillary diffusion? Sorry, pulmonary diffusion. I have one quick question. Um, so you're saying with the 20 and the five milliliters, the diffusion is happening from where to where? So in this example, there it's, the gas is always gonna move from high pressure to low pressure. So if we have 20 milliliters in the alveola of oxygen in the alveola and five in the capillary, the gas is gonna move from high pressure to low pressure. Right. Okay, we're never gonna have more oxygen in the capillary than we do in the, in the alveola because the oxygen in the capillary is from the alveola. So it's not possible for us to have more oxygen in the capillary than we do in the alveola. The oxygen will never move from the capillary to the alveola. But carbon dioxide, we have higher partial pressure in the capillary because the muscles are producing carbon dioxide. The bicarbonate buffer is producing carbon dioxide. There's not a lot of carbon dioxide in the air we're breathing. So the carbon dioxide will always be diffusing from the capillary to the lungs, but the bigger the difference, the, the higher the content of carbon dioxide in the blood, the faster the gas will diffuse across based on fixed law. We good on that? Good, good. Okay, if you wanna screenshot this, do it now, because I'm about to take it down, and we're gonna go into transportation.
Okay, so the four parts of respiration, we did pulmonary ventilation, the inspiration expiration, we did the lung volumes and Boyle's law, pulmonary diffusion, we did the respiratory membrane, we did Dalton's law, Henry's law, Fick's law. Okay, now we're going into transportation, which is bringing the oxygen to the exercising muscle. Okay, so I'm gonna clear this. Now we're on. So most of the oxygen, 98% of the oxygen that we transport is bound to hemoglobin. The other 2% gets dissolved into the blood, but most of it is bound to hemoglobin. So if the hemoglobin is completely saturated with oxygen, it can be called oxyhemoglobin. If it has released its oxygen, it can be called deoxyhemoglobin. I don't really use those terms a whole lot. You need to know what they mean, but I don't use them a whole lot. I will more refer to saturation levels. If saturation is high, if hemoglobin saturation is high, that means it's holding on to its oxygen. If hemoglobin saturation is low, it means it's releasing its oxygen. Okay, so if we think about that for a second, we want hemoglobin to grab onto the oxygen as it's going through the lungs. Okay, we want hemoglobin saturation to be high at the lungs. We want hemoglobin grabbing onto the oxygen. When it gets to the exercising muscle, we want it to release the oxygen. Okay, if it never releases the oxygen, the oxygen can't go into the muscle. It would just stay connected to the hemoglobin as it travels all the way through the body. Okay, the whole point is we want the hemoglobin to release the oxygen at the right place, which for us is at the exercising muscle. So we need some kind of um, way to convince the hemoglobin to release its oxygen when it gets to the exercising muscle. So um, high saturation, don't, don't think that high saturation is good and low saturation is bad. It's not good or, or bad, it depends on where you are. If, we're at, if the hemoglobin's at the lungs, we want it to be highly saturated. If the hemoglobin is at the exercise and muscle, we want its saturation to be low because that means it's releasing the oxygen so it can go into the muscle, okay? So then we need to talk about factors affecting hemoglobin saturation. This hemoglobin normally has a high affinity for oxygen and it wants to hold onto the oxygen. So we need some factors that convince hemoglobin to release the oxygen when it gets to the exercising muscle. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my whiteboard. And we're going to talk about factors affecting hemoglobin saturation. The abbreviation for hemoglobin is HB, and I will be using that a lot but you need to write it out on your test. So make sure you know what it stands for and how to spell it. Okay, factors affecting hemoglobin saturation. We're gonna have three. First one is partial pressure of oxygen. A low partial pressure of oxygen will cause low hemoglobin saturation. Low partial pressure of oxygen will cause low hemoglobin saturation. A high partial pressure of oxygen will cause high hemoglobin saturation. Let's think about that for a second. Where would partial pressure of oxygen be high? In the lungs or in the exercising muscle? In the lungs. In the lungs, partial pressure of oxygen is high because we're breathing in the oxygen. There's a lot of oxygen there. So in the lungs, a high PO2 will cause high hemoglobin saturation, which means hemoglobin is going to hold on to the oxygen, which is exactly what we want to happen in the lungs. Okay. Where is there low PO2? In the muscle? In the muscle. At the exercising muscle because... Hi, at the muscle, hi. Um, 
the muscle is extracting the oxygen from the blood to consume it. So the blood surrounding the muscle has low levels of oxygen, has a low PO2. So a low PO2 will cause a low hemoglobin saturation, which means hemoglobin is going to release its oxygen at the exercising muscle, which is exactly what we want to happen. Okay, so there's a graph for this. On the x-axis is going to be partial pressure of oxygen. On the y-axis is going to be percent hemoglobin saturation. Okay, I'm just gonna do low, medium, high. For each of these, low, medium, high. I'm not gonna write those on there, but understand that's what that means, low, medium, high. Okay, so when partial pressure of oxygen is high, where would hemoglobin saturation be? High or low? When, when PO2 is high, Oh, hi. Hi. When PO2 is high, saturation is high. So I'm going to put a data point there. When PO2 is low, where is saturation? Low. Low. Okay, so there are your two points. This relationship is not linear. So I'm not going to draw a straight line here. It's curvilinear, and it goes like this. I'm starting at the top. I'm starting at the high PO2 because we're moving from the lungs where it's high PO2 to the muscle where it's low PO2. So this curve moves in this direction, like this. It's a sigmoid curve. What that means is the, the decrease is slow at first, and then it drops off rapidly. That's different. You can't draw it like this. That would be incorrect because this means there's a rapid drop off at first and then it slows down, which is incorrect. So make sure you do the sigmoid curve in this direction. Okay. And we read this curve in this direction because we're going from high PO2 and high saturation at the lungs toward low PO2 and low saturation at the muscle. Okay. So this graph says that as PO2 decreases, hemoglobin saturation decreases. As PO2 decreases, and that'll happen as you're approaching the exercising muscle, where oxygen levels are low, as PO2 decreases, hemoglobin saturation decreases. That's what we want. That's important because that means as hemoglobin approaches the exercising muscle, it's going to release its oxygen. Okay, everybody okay with that? Let me know if you have a question. Okay, second factor affecting hemoglobin saturation is um, blood pH. Remember, blood pH refers to the acidity of the blood. The more acidic the blood, the lower the pH. So, low pH will cause, what do you think? Low saturation or high saturation? Low saturation. Low saturation. Low hemoglobin saturation. Okay. Where is there a low blood pH? In the blood. Oh, not in the blood. In, in the lungs or the exercising muscle? In the exercising muscle. In the exercising muscle. Why is there a low pH of the exercising muscle? Well, we talk about it in fatigue and glycolysis. What's, oh, causing, what's causing the low pH? The, the hydrogen acid. Acid. The hydrogen from the lactic acid. So the muscle is exercising at a high intensity. It's producing lactic acid. That hydrogen is going to decrease the blood pH at the exercising muscle. So when the hemoglobin arrives there, that low pH is going to cause the hemoglobin to release its oxygen, which is exactly what we want to happen. Okay, so we have a graph for that.
This graph is going to start out looking exactly the same as the first graph. It's going to have partial pressure of oxygen on the x-axis, percent hemoglobin saturation on the y-axis, and it's going to have the same curve. Low, medium, high, low, medium, high. I'm going to draw this same curve, same hemoglobin saturation curve. Okay, but I'm going to label this one as normal pH. And then I'm going to draw another curve for low pH. So, the curve for low pH is going to follow the same curve. It's going to be the same sigmoid curve. It's just either going to be above or below the normal pH curve. Do you think it will be above or below it? Below. Good. What does it mean to be below it? As you move up and down on this graph, what does it reflect? The hemoglobin saturation. The hemoglobin saturation. So. A low pH means you have lower saturation. So that's why this curve is underneath this one. In 446, they'll refer to this as a shift to the right. So a low pH causes a shift to the right in the hemoglobin saturation curve. Okay, so this first curve we drew, we'll call the hemoglobin saturation curve. On this curve that we just drew is called or effect. Okay, so the Bohr effect says a low pH will cause low hemoglobin saturation. So that's this drawing. Okay, so it has the normal hemoglobin saturation curve on it, reflecting um, hemoglobin saturation at normal pH, and then it compares it to hemoglobin saturation at a lower pH. So this graph says a low pH will cause low hemoglobin saturation. That's important because low pH is occurring at the exercising muscle. So this ensures that the oxygen will be released at the exercising muscle. Okay, everybody okay with that? No questions? Okay, third factor affecting hemoglobin saturation will be temperature. Ariel, tell me how you think temperature will affect hemoglobin saturation. Um, I feel like it'll cause it to go up. High temperature or low temperature? Uh, high temperature would cause it to go up. Would go cause high. saturation to go up? Yeah, that's what I would think. Why do you think that? Uh, just the increase in temperature would cause an increase in pH. Temperature doesn't affect pH. Okay. Um, Nick Zhao, how do you think temperature will affect hemoglobin saturation? Um, I agree with Ariel. I think that when the temperature increases, I think, I mean, I thought the rate of um, gas movement would increase as well. So maybe it would the oxygen would bind a hemoglobin more. Okay, so let's think this through. All, all of these, the both factors I gave you so far are helping us get oxygen to the exercising muscle. Something that's happening at the exercising muscle that's causing hemoglobin to decrease its affinity for oxygen and release it so that we can get oxygen to go into the muscle. All of these things are helping us exercise. So is the temperature going to be high or low at the exercising muscle? High. 
Temperature is going to be high of the exercising muscle because heat is a byproduct of metabolism. Okay, so how do you think high temperature will affect hemoglobin saturation? It'll decrease it. It'll decrease hemoglobin saturation because that's what causes the hemoglobin to release the oxygen at the exercising muscle. Okay, all of these factors are causing hemoglobin to release its oxygen at the exercising muscle. Okay, so high temperature will cause low hemoglobin saturation. So all the things I'm writing on here are what's causing low hemoglobin saturation because low hemoglobin saturation means hemoglobin is releasing the oxygen and all of these things are happening at the exercising muscle. Okay, so let's draw this one. It's gonna be the same hemoglobin saturation curve with PO2 on the x-axis and percent hemoglobin saturation on the y-axis. High, low. As PO2 decreases, hemoglobin saturation decreases. And we'll call that normal temperature. Okay, we're going to draw another curve on here for high temperature. Will that curve be above or below the normal temperature curve? Above. Below. Okay, I heard above and below. Which one is it? Below. below. Okay. What does it mean to move down on this graph? You have a lower saturation. Right. It means lower saturation. So higher temperature is going to give us a lower saturation. So this is high temperature. Okay, so higher temperature means lower saturation. So as temperature increases, saturation decreases. So the reason PO2 is on this graph is because really what it's saying is you could select any PO2. Let's, let's say we select a moderate PO2. At any given PO2, hemoglobin saturation is lower where the temperature is lower. That's what this graph is really saying, okay? But when you explain it to me, you don't need to include the PO2. You can just say, this graph is saying that higher temperature causes lower hemoglobin saturation. That's important because the temperature is high at the exercising muscle. So this ensures that oxygen is dropped off at the exercising muscle. Okay, there's not really a name for this graph except the, temp the effect of temperature on hemoglobin saturation. You can call it that if you want. Um, so you need to know these three factors affecting hemoglobin saturation and you need to be able to draw, well, you won't be drawing graph on these tests, but um, be able to explain the graph. So you need to be able to explain what the graph is saying and you also need to be able to explain the importance of it. Okay, for example, the first hemoglobin saturation curve, the very first one we drew, if you're reading the curve, it says as PO2 decreases, hemoglobin saturation decreases. Okay, that's explaining what the curve says. The importance of that is that PO2 is low at the exercising muscle. So this means that hemoglobin is releasing its oxygen at the exercising muscle. Okay, so you need to be able to explain what the graph is saying and then also explain why that's important. Questions on any of these factors affecting hemoglobin saturation? Okay, so this is how we get oxygen to be released at the exercising muscle. So that's the transportation part of it. Okay, next we're gonna go into capillary diffusion, which is how we get the oxygen into the exercising muscle and into the mitochondria. Okay, this is just dropping it off there. Um, you might wanna screenshot this if you haven't yet. I'm gonna take it down. So, we have, actually, I'm gonna draw some more on here. Okay. 
this is the muscle. This is the capillary. This is the mitochondria. Okay, so the blood is moving in this direction. And we have hemoglobin bound to the oxygen. Okay, we have oxyhemoglobin here. It arrives at this muscle. If this muscle is exercising, tell me some conditions you'd expect to see here at the exercising muscle. High saturation of, no, low saturation of oxygen. Okay, so low PO2. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, low PA. CO2. IPCO2. IPCO2. What else? Low blood pH. Okay, what else? High temperature. Keep going. There are six of them. Increased lactic acid. Increased hydrogen. So these are our six local conditions at the exercising muscle that we talked about that are going to trigger vasodilation here to bring in more blood. Yes? So are these, are any of these local conditions at the exercising muscle going to have an effect on the hemoglobin? Yes. No. yes. Which ones? Low PO2 low pH and high temperature. Yes, these things that affect hemoglobin are part of the conditions at the exercising muscle. So when this hemoglobin, this oxygenated hemoglobin with high saturation arrives with this exercising muscle, approaches these conditions, it's going to release its oxygen. Okay, so then we're gonna end up with deoxyhemoglobin over here, low saturation, and we're going to have oxygen dropped off here. Where do we need the oxygen to go? To the mitochondria. To the mitochondria. How do we get the oxygen to the mitochondria? With myoglobin. Myoglobin. So remember that hemoglobin carries the oxygen when it's in the blood. Myoglobin carries the oxygen when it's in the muscle. So the myoglobin needs to pick up this oxygen that the hemoglobin dropped off and deliver it to the mitochondria where we consume it in the electron transport chain. Okay, which means that in the same conditions at the exercising muscle, the myoglobin has to behave differently than the hemoglobin. Okay, in these conditions, hemoglobin loses its affinity for oxygen. It releases it. If myoglobin were to act the same way as hemoglobin, we wouldn't be able to deliver the oxygen to the mitochondria. So myoglobin has to respond differently in these conditions. Okay, so we have a graph for that. That is going to be the myoglobin saturation curve. Let me draw up here. It's going to start out with the hemoglobin saturation curve, and then we're going to add the myoglobin saturation curve to it so we can compare them. Okay, so it's still going to have PO2 on the x-axis. The y-axis is going to be just percent saturation, not percent hemoglobin saturation, because I'm going to draw one curve for hemoglobin and one curve for myoglobin. So it's just percent saturation. I'm going to do low, medium, high, low, medium, high. I'm going to start out with the hemoglobin saturation curve. So we know in hemoglobin, for hemoglobin, when PO2 is high, saturation is high. And when PO2 is low, saturation is low. And we have the sigmoid curve. 
Okay, so this is hemoglobin. For myoglobin, myoglobin always has a high affinity for oxygen. Even in these conditions of low PO2 and high temperature and low pH, it's going to retain its affinity for oxygen until it gets to the mitochondria, which means myoglobin saturation is going to stay high as long as it possibly can and then drop at the very end when it gets to the mitochondria. Okay, so this is myoglobin. Okay, I'm abbreviating it here because I don't have, well, actually, I do have space. Make sure you know what that stands for. The blue one is the myoglobin saturation curve. So what this means is, as hemoglobin is releasing its oxygen at the exercising muscle, myoglobin is picking it up. When hemoglobin is unloading, myoglobin is loading. That's important because that allows the myoglobin to deliver the oxygen to the mitochondria. Okay? If they were both releasing oxygen, we wouldn't be able to get, have the myoglobin deliver the oxygen to the mitochondria. Okay, so this curve says that myoglobin's um, saturation level or its affinity for oxygen stays high, even in conditions of low PO2. So while hemoglobin is releasing its oxygen, myoglobin is picking it up. That's important because it allows the myoglobin to deliver the oxygen to the mitochondria. Okay, questions on that? Can you say that last part one more time, please? The... Yes. Thank you. As um, PO2 is decreasing, hemoglobin is releasing its oxygen, myoglobin is picking it up. So myoglobin retains its saturation level, retains its affinity for oxygen, even at low PO2. That allows the myoglobin to deliver the oxygen to the exercising muscle. Okay, so if you go back and look at, at my drawing down here of the, of the muscle. Okay, the hemoglobin is in the blood here. It arrives at the exercising muscle that has all these conditions happening at it, causing it to release its oxygen. Okay, myoglobin in these same conditions has to still be loading its oxygen. When hemoglobin is unloading, myoglobin is loading, that allows it to bring the oxygen over to the mitochondria. Okay, so everything that I've described here through the transportation and through the capillary diffusion, all of this is helping us exercise. It's helping us get oxygen to the muscle and then into the mitochondria. So when you're describing this myoglobin saturation curve, what you can't say is that myoglobin is delivering oxygen to the exercising muscle. Do you see why that would be incorrect? Myoglobin is already in the exercising muscle. By the time myoglobin gets the oxygen, the oxygen is already at the exercising muscle. So myoglobin is not delivering oxygen to the exercising muscle. Where is myoglobin delivering oxygen to? The mitochondria. The mitochondria. So this relationship allows myoglobin to deliver oxygen to the mitochondria in the exercising muscle. Good? Now I'm gonna clear this drawing if you want to take a screenshot. Everybody good? Can I clear it? Yep. Silence means yes, Black, go ahead and clear it. <laughs> okay, there you go. Okay, so we're still on capillary diffusion. I just have um, some more terminology for you. So I'm gonna redraw this muscle capillary. OK, 
Okay, so let's say coming into the muscle, we have 20 milliliters of oxygen in the arterial blood. In the venous blood, we have 15 milliliters of oxygen. Okay, these numbers are not important numbers, I'm just illustrating a concept. Okay, so in the arterial blood, we have 20 milliliters of oxygen. In the venous blood, we have 15 milliliters of oxygen. How much oxygen did the muscle consume? Five. Five milliliters. How did you figure that out? Just subtract it. Okay, so you did the oxygen content of the arterial blood minus the oxygen content of the venous blood. Yes? Yes. That's called AVO2 difference. AVO2 difference is the difference between the oxygen content of the arterial blood and the oxygen content of the venous blood. That's what the AV stands for in AVO2 difference. It's arterial minus venous. Okay, so AVO2 difference is the difference between the oxygen content of the arterial blood and the oxygen content of the venous blood. It reflects how much oxygen the muscle consumed. Because the larger the difference, the larger the AVO2 difference, the more oxygen the muscle consumed. Okay, so if we have the same 20 milliliters of oxygen coming in, but only five milliliters of oxygen coming out, how much oxygen did the muscle consume? 15. 15 milliliters. So as the difference goes up, as, as AVO2 difference goes up, it means that the muscle consumed more oxygen. Okay, so as exercise intensity increases, AVO2 difference increases. Does that mean the muscle's consuming more oxygen? Okay, this is a very, very, very important concept that we're going to talk about a lot after the midterm. Very important to, to training adaptations. Okay, questions on that term? So these are not numbers you need to know. This was just to illustrate the concept of what AVO2 difference means. You good? Okay. Um, then I just have a couple of terms for you. Okay. Um, hyperventilation. So we're, we're done with the respiration. Now with the four parts of respiration, we're done. I'm just throwing a couple more terms at you. Hyperventilation. Um, breathing more than is necessary, basically. So um, we're not really talking about EPOC at this point, we're talking about in resting conditions. Um, so I'm just reading through the chat messages right now. Okay. Thank you, Mira, for answering that. Um, so this is like, most of the time when you encounter this, it's like someone who's crying hysterically and they're hyperventilating and breathing really, really fast. And what are you supposed to do when someone's hyperventilating, you know? Put your arms above your head. Like not, not arms above your head. That's a good guess though. You yeah, ever heard of putting a, putting a paper bag over the person's mouth when they're hyperventilating? Because the problem with hyperventilating is when you hyperventilate, you blow off too much carbon dioxide. And remember that carbon dioxide has a function. Carbon dioxide triggers the inspiratory centers in your brain to cause you to, to breathe more. It triggers your respiration. So if you blow off too much carbon dioxide, you lose your urge to, to inspire. You lose your urge to breathe. So a person who blows off too much carbon dioxide will end up passing out from lack of oxygen because they'll stop inspiring. So if you put the paper bag over their mouth, it forces them to rebreathe the carbon dioxide that they're expiring, because there's not much carbon dioxide in the air that we breathe. So if you put the paper bag over their mouth, they rebreathe the carbon dioxide that they're expiring and they'll stay conscious, they'll keep breathing, okay? The reason this is relevant to exercise physiology is because we actually use this, we used to use this as a technique in hydrostatic weighing. 
You, have you guys heard of hydrostatic weighing? So hydrostatic weighing used to be our gold standard for measuring body composition. Uh, it's underwater weighing. So because fat floats in water and muscle sinks, if you weigh yourself outside of the water and then you weigh yourself underneath the water, based on the differences between the two, we can tell how much of your body weight is fat and how much of it is not. So to do this, so we used to have a big hydrostatic weighing tank in the lab, full of water, it has a scale, a very sensitive scale underneath it. So to measure your body composition, you would, um, you have to completely submerge yourself underwater and sit on the scale very still for an extended period of time while we weigh you underwater. So you can't take a deep breath in and then go underwater like you would normally do because the, the air inside your lungs will make you float, which will be counted as fat. So you have, the technique is to do a maximal expiration before you go underwater. So imagine yourself blowing out all of your air, going underwater and having to sit very calmly underwater for an extended period of time. It's, it's uncomfortable. So the technique is to hyperventilate first. If you hyperventilate eight or 10 times and then do a maximal expiration and go underwater, you don't have the urge to come up for air because you've blown off your carbon dioxide. So you can sit under there comfortably for an extended period of time. So we use that technique to help us with that. We don't use that so much anymore because now we more use um, bioelectrical impedance instead of the hydrostatic weighing. But that was an important concept to understand for the, the hydrostatic wing. Now, we just say, because you understand how the respiration works, when you're um, swimming with your friends this summer, you can challenge them. I can stay underwater longer than you, and then turn around and hyperventilate a few times, and then go under, and you'll, you'll win. So you can bet a lot of money on that one. <laughs> but do that at your own risk. I'm not saying you should do it. I'm just saying, theoretically, it should work if you want to try it. Okay. Um, but you should understand the relationship between carbon dioxide and breathing. So remember we said when you're exercising at high intensity, you're producing a lot of lactic acid, which is picked up by the bicarbonate buffer, which creates carbon dioxide, which triggers your breathing. So that's why you're always out of breath when you're working at a high intensity and producing lactic acid and those things go together. Okay, so you should understand that relationship. Um, Valsalva maneuver, let me write that one down for you. Dys dyspnea is another term on there, which just means breathlessness. Um, you don't really need to worry about um, Valsalva maneuver. You guys heard of the Valsalva maneuver? Yes, no? Valsalva maneuver is basically holding your breath during exertion. So this, this tends to happen when you're lifting heavy weights, okay? Which is why we talk about it because people do heavy weight lifting. They, the tendency is when you're lifting something that's very challenging to lift, you, you hold your breath while you're doing it during exertion, right? So this is dangerous because when you hold your breath during exertion, it spikes up the pressure, the blood pressure in your thoracic cavity significantly. So if someone has high blood pressure to begin with or is otherwise at risk for a heart attack, causing a significant instantaneous spike in your blood pressure like that can trigger a heart attack. So it can be very dangerous. So this is why we always say exhale during the exertion, during weightlifting, right? We always are telling people exhale as you lift. The reason for that is because that's when they're most likely to hold their breath and do the Valsalva maneuver is during the hardest part of the movement. So we always tell them to, to exhale during that. But if you're working with a power lifter, power lifters actually use the Valsalva maneuver as a bracing technique. Because when you do that, it gives you more stability through your torso. It is an actual technique to use for stability. You can lift heavier weights while you're doing the Valsalva maneuver but it's a risky thing to do. So you have to weigh the benefits and risks. If you are working with a recreational exerciser who's lifting for health and fitness, we want them to avoid the Valsalva maneuver. 
If you are working with a competitive power lifter, Valsalva maneuver is a, is a stabilizing technique. And when you're working with a, an elite competitive athlete, sometimes they do things that are not safe in order to win the competition. It's just part of training an athlete. So, but if you're training a non-competitive lifter, we try to avoid that. Okay, questions on that? Okay, that's the end of this chapter. Which means no more new information for your test. You have all of your information. You should be able to answer everything on your study guide. So if there's something you see on the study guide that I haven't covered, make sure you look at that. We didn't review um, cardiovascular drift today. You guys okay on cardiovascular drift? Good. Rachel says she's good. Is anybody else good? Now is a good time to ask questions. Okay, I know you got several emails over the weekend from your PLS. Uh, I hope that you read through them because they are giving you a lot of review sessions this week as your test is coming up. So they're not bombarding you with useless information. They're bombarding you with, here's some help, here's some help, here's some help. So please look through that and take advantage of all the opportunities you're being offered for help, okay? But in order to get the most out of that, you need to be involved and active. If you're in, in the review sessions quietly listening, it's not going to help you as much as if you're trying to answer, think of answers and answer. It's better to think of an answer and answer incorrectly than to sit back and listen to everybody else answer. Okay, and that goes for my review as well on Wednesday. Okay. Do you have any questions for me? For the review on Wednesday, is it going to be, I know it's impossible to do like Jeopardy, but is it going to be like another game review or just like a free um, My plan right now is to do Jeopardy. I just won't be able to throw candy at you. Um, but I still, I mean, I have the Jeopardy questions all set up. Um, I just have, have I'm either going to figure out a way to do that. Um, so you guys can see the board and what questions are left and you can pick questions and I'll just be calling on you guys. Um, unless I think of a different way to do it by Wednesday. Um, that, that's still my plan. Okay, so you guys are gonna be answering questions. It's not gonna be me lecturing. It's gonna be you guys answering questions. So come in prepared to be involved in that. Dr. Fleck, would hyperventilation be a good tool for like synchronized swimmers? Um, well, synchronized swimmers, that's a good question. I don't think so because they're going in and out of the water. Like they don't have time to come up and hyperventilate several times before they go back under. Um, they just probably have to train their lung capacity to be able to hold a lot of oxygen, to be able to hold their breath for a long time. That's, yeah, I've never seen a synchronized swimmer hyperventilate. That's a good question. I mean, theoretically, it would help them stay under longer. It's just not practical for within their sport to do that, you know? Professor, can you explain one more time why uh, hyperventilation um, causes you to not breathe as heavily? Yes, because when you hyperventilate, you're blowing off too much carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, you need some carbon dioxide in your system to trigger your brain, your inspiratory centers in your brain to give you the urge to inspire. And that CO2 sensed by the chemoreceptors, right? For, to give you that urge to... Well, no, the, chem the chemoreceptors are sensing those conditions to trigger vasodilation at the arterioles. Right. For the rest of the respiration is controlled by um, your brain, your, your hypothalamus in your brain. Right, okay, thank you. So the carbon dioxide will affect that.
All right, I will stay on for a couple more minutes if you want to stay and ask a question.